And welcome everybody to Hands On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgil Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because once again, you know, right before the show, everything is calm and fine. All systems are go here at the uh, Midwest Command Center. And then showtime comes up and all sorts of weird things happen. And But you know what? I got the video going. We got the uh, radio feed. Everything is online and ready to go. But man, it's right up to the last second. Uh, got a great show in store for us today. Uh, coming up on the other side of the break, we're going to have a good friend, Kyle Whittington, with us. And we're going to talk about something that he's been focusing on. And I think it's uh, something that... Uh, we need all apologists to be aware of and engage in, and that is dealing with all the low-hanging fruit arguments. You know, there are just some arguments out there that's just begging to be picked because they're just so bad. And uh, Kyle's been doing a fantastic job on his YouTube channel, which is Kyle Whittington, by the way, uh, with the segments on low-hanging fruit, and uh, he's made it fun and delightful, and so uh, I thought, wow, this would be a great opportunity to talk about it on the show. Like I said, that's coming up on the other side of the break. On this side of the break, folks, we're going to sharpen our critical thinking skills with our Finding the Fallacy segment, and also we're going to meet an early church father. Today's early church father is, I think, a rather little-known early church father, it is Victor Avita. Victor Avita. Yeah, I, like I said, not somebody you probably would know. But that's the beauty of our Make the Early Church Father segments is uh, to fill in all those gaps in our knowledge about the, the great Christian writers who wrote in the first eight centuries of the church. So, got lots of stuff in store for us today. So, I want to begin on the right foot by welcoming you all to the show. So, welcome aboard all of you listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world. And lest I forget the live stream peeps, how you doing? It's great to have you all with us today. Yeah, hey, getting through technical problems, but uh, it's been a busy, busy day for me. Um, as you know, every Thursday, uh, Matt Swaim has me on the Sunrise Morning Show on EWTN. And uh, talk about a section of my book, Revolt Against Reality. That's always a ton of fun. Although I have to admit, it's a little hard to have a clear mind that early in the morning. And then uh, right before the show, uh, I was privileged to be asked to come on the Coming Home Network uh, channel, I guess you would say. And um, talk about the Deuteral Canon with Matt Swaim again. So, hey, got a double dose of Matt Swaim today, which is cool. We had him on the show the other day. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I should, since I mentioned the books, I might as well mention them all. So we talked about the Deuteral Canon, focused on why Catholic Bibles are bigger and the case for the Deuteral Canon, two books I wrote on the subject. Uh, Revolt Against Reality, that's also available at Catholic.com, Catholic Answers Press, and uh, lest I forget, I got to mention my new book, which I'm going to be diving in, I think, a little bit more next week. And that is The Gospel Truth, where uh, how do we know what Jesus taught? Um, so uh, there'll be more stuff on that coming up. But enough about me. Uh, why don't we talk about some important stuff? Like, for example... Where can you access this show if you want to catch it on podcast? Maybe you, you want to hear our interview with Kyle, but, uh, you know, the baby's crying or called into a meeting or something. Well, don't worry. All you have to do is just go to virtualmostpowerfulradio.org, which is the uh, official VMPR website. And uh, just scroll down, click on Hands on Apologetics, and boom, you got all the programs right there. And including this one will be up there shortly. And you can listen to our interview with Kyle uh, at your convenience. You can take notes. Uh, you can share with friends, which is even better. You know, uh, let's spread the word about the, the show. And uh, we've grown by leaps and bounds thanks to your generosity. So, yeah, keep telling your friends, sharing uh, programs and stuff. And uh, let's grow our listenership. Also, if you would like to get a hold of me, there's a really easy way to do that. That is through the official Dojo mailbox, which is questions at handsonapologetics.com. Yeah, I actually paused. <laughs> that's, that's what you get for working, uh, getting up early in the morning is, uh, 
you have these little brain freezes. Yeah, I actually had to think about that, even though I've been given it every day, every show day for the past couple of years. Questions at handsonapologetics.com. That's the easy way to get a hold of me. And I do try to answer your emails. So keep them coming, folks. All right. Now it's time for Finding the Fallacy. Today's Finding the Fallacy is the appeal to pity. The appeal to pity. An appeal to pity fallacy is committed when the arguer attempts to influence the listener not by providing good reasons for the conclusion, but by mentioning sad or difficult circumstances that are irrelevant to the issue. And uh, man, yeah, uh, in this day and age where victimization has become a weapon, you know, and everybody claims to be a victim. The appeal to pity, I think, is probably more popular today than it, it certainly has been through my lifetime and probably for uh, probably generations before. Um, it, it, the thing is, the appeal to pity is just part of a larger group of fallacies as the, uh, where it tries to manipulate one's emotions to accept a particular conclusion. And therefore, it's kind of uh, a bit of a... a red herring or even a non sequitur in that, uh, you know, one's emotions or pity shouldn't affect your decision, whether something is true, good or just right. Um, uh, in fact, it's sometimes it's good to set aside emotions so you can get a clear picture of which, whether something is correct or not. Um, uh, but the appeal to pity works against that by appealing to your sense of pity in order to gain favor with you, in order that you'll be more accepting of a particular position, even though there's really no good reasons for that particular position itself. And uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty straightforward. Like I said, very, very popular fallacy today. Um, it's easy to claim victimhood, to gain the sim sympathy of the audience. And um, that's something that Believe it or not, we find right here in our Finding the Fallacy segment. So the appeal to pity. All right, let's meet our early church father for today in obscure one, certainly, but uh, still uh, important one. It is Victor of Vita. Little is known of Victor, Bishop of Vita of the North, uh, excuse me, of the African province of Bicinia. He's the author of uh, The History of Persecutions of the African Province, uh, or Provinces, excuse me, I'm doing some on-the-fly Latin translation here, uh, which recounts the terrible sufferings of Catholics in Africa during the time of the Vandal Kings uh, Gershwich and Hundrich, which would basically be between the year uh, 428 A.D. and 484 A.D., and as Jurgen's Faith Early Fathers notes, which we use for this segment, this persecution is as bloody as any under imperial Rome, uh, but it was not a general persecution of Christianity as such, but specifically it was a persecution of Catholics as distinct from Arians. As you know, the, the Vandals were at least nominally Christian, uh, but like all the barbarian Christians, uh, with the exception of the Franks, their Christianity came to them in Arian form. And of course, you, as you know, Arianism is the belief that the Son is not co-eternal with the Father, that the Son was created by the Father. So there was a time when the Son did not exist. And essentially, it demotes the Son to a godlike creature of the Father, but not God from God, life from light, true God from true God, consubstantial with the Father. Okay, so the Arians, the Vandals, excuse me, the Vandals in the north as they invaded down into Africa, uh, set about persecuting not just Christians, but specifically Catholics who held to the Orthodox faith. And that's where Victor Vita comes in. He wrote his history of persecution in the province of Africa. Uh, he wrote that while Hundrick was still alive, which means it was written before December 484 AD, the final chapter of the work, he recounts Hundrick's death. It, it, that's probably a later and inauthentic addition to the work. And so we could date it roughly around 488, 489. And actually he has some, he has some good apologetic stuff in it. So let me give you a quick quote. 
actually, no, I won't be able to do the quote. Darn. It basically speaks about remembering that Christ has two natures. And so when you approach the New Testament text, whenever you see something that's sublime and above that of humanity, um, that's when you ascribe it to uh, Christ's divine nature. But he says, whenever it is told more humble of him, which is below the dignity of the heavenly power, where he refer not to the word of God, but to the manhood which it assumed, uh, or which he assumed. Uh, this then, as we remarked, is said of his divinity, the Father and I are one, and whoever sees me has seen the Father, but are, there are other sayings that are referred to him according to his humanity, such as the Father is greater than I. Now, for those of you who have had discussions with Jehovah Witnesses, you'll recognize those texts because those are the, the big texts used by them. Uh, and uh, so Victor Vita gives you uh, an apologetic hack <laughs> to approach the New Testament in such a way that you can see some things are spoken in terms of Christ's divinity. Other things are spoken in terms of his humanity. And that's our early church father for today, Victor Vita. Coming up next, we're going to be chatting with Kyle Whittington. We're going to talk about answering low-hanging fruit argument. Now more than ever, you need to do business with like-minded companies. That's why you should switch to the Pro-Life Phone Company. Charity Mobile sends 5% of your monthly plan price to the Pro-Life charity of your choice. To learn more about their free phone offer and no-contract nationwide phone service, visit CharityMobile.com or call 877-474-3662 and mention the Bishop Strickland Hour. That's CharityMobile.com. And welcome back, everybody. Hands on apologetics. Well, if you're like me, you're probably a social media junkie. Uh, maybe you hang around YouTube way too much. And, and you watch a lot of like high-level, very sophisticated, complex uh, apologetics and debates and so on. And that's fine and dandy, but really when it comes to real life, it's not so much the, the super sophisticated, high, you know, high, highly complex arguments that you run into, but it's usually much more simple. In fact, uh, there's a lot of arguments that you would call low hanging fruit arguments because they're so easy to pick. And, uh, Although they're not very tasty, I must say. So uh, should we engage in uh, uh, these low-hanging fruit arguments? How should we engage with them? And how do we keep our sanity while engaging with these type of arguments? Well, that's why we have our guest today, Kyle Whittington. Kyle runs a the uh, creatively named YouTube channel, uh, Kyle Whittington. His channel focuses on conversion stories, interviews with pleasant non-Catholics, and low-hanging fruit apologetics. Kyle is based in St. Louis area with his lovely wife, Julia, and four children, with the fifth due in September. So, Kyle Whittington, welcome back to Hands-On Apologetics. All right. Thanks, Gary. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and congratulations in advance on the uh, new coming baby. That's awesome. Oh, oh yeah, it's great. It's it's the best kind of chaos. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, you you bring up a good point that um, you know one one thought was, that I had was that you know if you're if you're listening to this show right now, chances are you're pretty familiar with the apologetic scene and you're just trying to sharpen your skills. So you're familiar with these guys who are like the heavyweights and apologetics on on you know like the Protestant side, such as you know Dr. Gavin Ortland and whatnot. However, whenever you take it down to like the street level, a lot of these guys have no idea who Gavin Ortland is or his arguments against iconography and, and, and whatnot. And it, it's, you know, whenever you have these conversations with normal people, their arguments are really based off of their anti-Catholic arguments are based off of kind of nonsense that they grew up hearing. And, you know, at the same time, like and that, that doesn't make them stupid. That just makes them a normal person. So that's why I think that like these kinds of arguments, these like super easy anti-Catholic arguments are worth addressing and getting really well versed in because, well, I mean, this is what really is the problem. So, but, uh, yeah, so, and that, and that's like, if you're, if you're the kind of person who's listening to this show right now, you're weird in like the best possible kind of way. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I just, I want to talk a bit about, about these kinds of arguments that pop up that we've all heard and I just 
you know, want to just let's let's uh, let's tear them down a little bit and get a little, have a little fun with it. And then also uh, I, I want to encourage people like if you thought about like getting into apologetics, like as a as a hobby, you know, and start publishing your own stuff. Like I would say that, you know, the bar to cross that threshold is a lot lower than what you think it is, because the big arguments that are the most pervasive are the easiest ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it, it tends to be um, the most far fetched, oddly enough, you know, the most oh, common. Yeah. Uh, it, it's amazing. If, in some ways that sometimes actually makes it hard to refute because it's so much fantasy involved in mythology. It's, it's right. hard to, to hammer it with the, you know, the, the baseball bat hitting the pinata correctly. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it's also, uh, you know, you kind of touched on it a little bit of like, how do we do this? Well, I will say that the, the, my low hanging fruit videos are probably not going to convince anybody that is like steeped in these, in this anti-Catholic rhetoric that is nonsense. They're probably just going to come in and ridicule me and say, Oh, look at this clown. He's so deceived without really offering any real reasons for that. The real stuff is going to happen whenever you befriend these people and you talk to them. So this is where I believe like my videos come uh, come in is because I'm presenting the information in an entertaining way because I try to be funny. And so that way, whenever you take my snarky comments and whatnot and apply it to the friends that you're interacting with who are going to probably be behaving themselves a lot better than, you know, somebody like Steven Anderson or something like that. You know, then you can start those conversations and, you know, maybe, oh, hey, I remember this funny thing that this guy on YouTube said once. And that's <laughs> that's my hope for those. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why you have low hanging fruit is precisely because the people making the arguments don't watch, you know, the oh, yeah. opponents videos. They, they're, they just already have their conclusions and they're just firing blind. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, I did I did a low hanging fruit stream last night. So uh, I'm actually I don't want to say that I'm quite proud of this, but I'm very pleased with the result. So if you go onto YouTube right now and type in the bastardization of Christianity, oh, you'll yeah, see I the, saw that. Yeah, you'll see the two part sermon um, that this guy gave. But then the third result is my refutation of the first part. So I'm starting to just give them the same titles that these these things have so that way if somebody does go looking for them they can see that i've i've basically hit back and um that's you know i'm very pleased seeing that result yeah yeah and i mean hey if it's a uh, clickbait you know that type of title <laughs> yeah. why not you exactly. know it's a it, turnabout's fair play plus you help people who are trying to find the video to realize wow so, somebody actually commented on it Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, is all low hanging fruit the same or does it kind of fall into different categories? Well, you know, you'll always, you always hear some of the same arguments repeated and it's, it's really funny whenever you're listening to these arguments, you can usually like pause it and say, this is the point that he's about to lead into and he's <laughs> going to make this point. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've started making the low hanging fruit a drinking game. Uh, so yep. it's like every time they say something that's explicitly wrong about the church, take a drink. And, you know, some of them get kind of dangerous because it's like, OK, make sure you're dry, you make sure you're you're drinking yingling or something that's on the lighter <laughs> side, because otherwise, uh, you know, you, the game's going to end in the hospital. But uh, but like I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and like start raising my beer because it's just like, yep, oh, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. <laughs> and then and it, it goes to fail and never fails like they always do it. So, yeah. um, I guess one of some of the pet, pet, I guess my pet favorite terrible arguments is going to be like, oh, Catholics engage in idol worship and Mary worship. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard that one before. I don't know if you've come across that one. No, <laughs> um, I, never, I never heard anybody ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's definitely low hanging fruit. You, you hear all over the place. Yeah. Um, and m yeah. my, 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 uh, first response to that is always, I worship Mary. I'm sorry. What is that? What is worship? If I'd never, if I had no concept of what worship is, how would you explain it to me? And then, because you might as well be speaking different languages if they're saying like, oh, prayer is worship. And I've, I've heard like Mike Gendron say that explicitly, prayer is worship. It's like, well, no, not always. If I ask anybody to do anything, am I worshiping them? No, that's all that means. So a lot right. of times it's just a distinction in terms. And then of course, like you bring in sacrifice and I've seen an inflammatory like response to this. It, it's, 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 over, it's an oversimplification. I wouldn't recommend people using this, but they say like I've heard people say, well, Protestants don't even worship God. 
So that's why what we do, that's why we, when we venerate Mary and the saints, it looks like worship to them because they only venerate God. Now, let me go ahead and like dismantle that real quick because as long as you're recognizing God as God, that is still an act of adoration, therefore an act of worship. So, uh, you know, so that's a, that's a, that's a low hanging fruit argument from like a Catholic perspective. So, um, but yeah, so that, that's, that's one of the biggest things just have that conversation of like, what is actually the nature of worship and how am I engaging in it? Because whenever you really get down to it, it's like, well, you're treating her like God. It's like, no, I'm not. I don't think that she's God. And whenever you say like, oh, well, you don't think she's God. It's like, okay, so what you're saying is your argument is actually a baseless accusation. It's not a real argument. And from there, you can move the conversation forward. Yeah, good. Yeah, th- and you're absolutely right. You need to define terms at the outset. And the, the low-hanging fruit, I mean, I think that's the bread and butter of all these low-hanging fruit arguments is they they love to live in the ambiguity in the language, you know. And uh, so on the surface, it sounds plausible. But when you start asking them to define things, that's when it falls apart. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, once again, I want to underline that, like, the, for the most part, these guys are not malicious. They're not um, they're not setting out with the intention to spread lies. Yeah, um, right. And so I always make a very like I always make a point to make the distinction of to never call them a liar. But like, nonetheless, they are repeating a lie. Um, so. That's, you know, that may be a, a nuanced distinction that nobody else cares about. But, you know, I always think it's very important to, like, not attack the, the person. But, um, but yeah, so the I, I think uh, you might you might know a little bit about this one. So I might actually let you speak on this a little bit. But the next one is uh, the uh, the church added books to the Bible. And I always I always laugh a little bit. And this will I've got this one the next up on my list of like, oh, uh, th- this verse isn't in the Bible. And I always say that that's rich talk coming from the people that removed seven books. So it's just like, oh, Catholics don't like this verse. And I'm like, well, you didn't like entire books. So, you know, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the hypocrisy that is, you know, I think is completely lost on them. But yeah, so what would you, what would be your response? Like, I guess a quick little response to, you know, oh, well, Catholics yeah. added books to the Bible. Yeah, um, yeah, boy, you know, that's tough, Kyle, because that's that's my wheelhouse, and so mm-hmm. I always love to get into the minutiae. But they added books and nobody noticed? That's, I mean, that seems to be just patently, I mean, even if you don't know any history, and you don't understand anything about the church, mm-hmm. it's like, what, the pastor showed up one Sunday and said, okay, everybody needs to switch out their Bibles. We got seven more books than before, <laughs> you know, than we had before. Uh, you know, how would that practically work out? And yeah. hopefully that kind of get their, you know, thinking, yeah, that does seem kind of unrealistic. Yeah. And like, you know, one thing that I'll do on my streams whenever this comes up is just like the church added or the Catholic church added books to the Bible. And I said, guilty as charged. The Catholic church, in fact, added 73 books to the Bible. Um, <laughs> and because it's just like, well, where did you get that? And, that? and that's where you can take the conversation there is just like, OK, where yeah. did the Bible come from? And then immediately you start to see Sola Scriptura fall to pieces here because, right. you know, uh, I think it was a uh, Mrs. Uh, Patty Bond who said you can't get past the table of contents without needing an authority to tell you what the table of contents should be. Right. And yeah, so that's that's all that you could just take the conversation in that direction. It, it's it's also so I, I guess worded another way. Whenever I said, you know, what is worship? When somebody said, well, you should you should pay attention to the Bible. Just go, I'm sorry, the what? The Bible. What is that? Tell tell me what that is and how do you how do you recognize it? And you know, you get that you get that need for authority rather quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, is this uh, is this a common low hanging fruit? The the canon. It is um, in like especially like Baptist fundamental fundamentalist circles. Um, mm-hmm. you, you'll 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 hear them bring that up a lot uh, because, you know, whenever they start condemning purgatory, they'll be like, they added books to try to say that purgatory is real. Right. And, you know, I've heard like, uh, I think his name's Todd Friel or something like that say like, uh, you know, prayers for the dead is a, is like a 16th century invention, which is nonsense because it's like, if that's the case, I, I wonder how we got the Orthodox on board with that as well. 
Um, <laughs> because, you know, by the 16th century, the East wanted very little to do with the West. Right. And then also, like, you know, whether you want to say that it's scripture or not, First and Second Maccabees is very much a book that exists, and the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're chatting with Kyle Whittington, talking about low-hanging fruit arguments. More to come right after this. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Kyle Whittington of the Kyle Whittington channel on YouTube. By the way, uh, check it out. He does a fantastic job on the channel. And uh, there's a lot of good humor, uh, just all done with style and panache. And I, I love a re- I love watching this stuff. So definitely check it out, Kyle Whittington on YouTube. Um, Kyle, before we we move on with some more low hanging fruit arguments, you know, it occurred to me during the break that you know, since these are are arguments that people put forward that really haven't looked into, uh, you know, whether they're true or really thought critically about it, it's probably not good to blast them with a whole bunch of you know facts or verses or mm-hmm. you know hard, you know real hard data. But maybe just to get them to think, I know that's kind of one of your techniques is to just get them think, yeah, that just doesn't sound right when you put it that way. Yeah, yeah. And actually, um, there's a this isn't a, an apologetic book, but it's a fantastic read. Uh, it's a secular book, but it's called uh, Never Split the Difference. And it's by this guy named uh, Chris Voss. And he's an FBI hostage negotiator. Uh, or he's a retired one. He used to be like the lead international hostage negotiator. And I read that. And one of the one of the lines in that book that's really stuck out to me is that like true negotiation is letting someone else have your way. Um, so that's basically why what I'm trying to frame these questions on is just like I want you to see things the way that I'm seeing them in a way that makes sense to you. Because at the end of the day, I can destroy someone with facts and logic and and whatnot. But Well, now that person's walking away dejected, which quite honestly, like if somebody's watching one of my, if a Protestant watches my low hanging fruit videos, like they're probably going to be unconvinced because there's no relationship there. I don't know this person. I don't know the way that they think it's whenever you're doing YouTube, it's like a shot in the dark and it might convince somebody, but chances are for the most part, it's not going to convince anybody. And that's why like the real intention is just the education of Catholics. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's also, uh, and this is why I I love because you inject a lot of humor and, uh, all sorts of different things, uh, because it's usually the low hanging fruit. That's really obnoxious. I mean, (laughs) it's, it's tough not to respond in, in like form, you know, to be just as obnoxious back. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what you animated in the, the previous, uh, segment. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, you always want to, and it's YouTube. So um, if it's not entertaining, nobody's going to watch it. Yeah. So, and yeah. it's like, it, this isn't a liturgy or anything like that. This is just some guy with a, you, some guy with a camera, you know, just, just sounding off basically. So yeah, so I, feel, I feel like humor is appropriate and, and whatnot. So I, I, I think, uh, it, I've gotten a lot of really good response from it. Uh, people have got, and I, I, I love getting the comments of like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way before. And it was just like, yes. Yeah. So there you go. But, But yeah, so but on that topic of, uh, you know, educating Catholics, this is actually one that I want people to know that this is a red flag, especially Catholics need to know that this is a red flag because, you know, I've noticed a lot of these low hanging fruit guys, they'll brag about converting Catholics. And it's just like that's that's a concern. And, you know, while we do want to reach souls too, another objective that we need to have in the church is to stop the bleeding, basically get people to stop leaving because that's just as important as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so an edge, so one thing that I want people to know is that there's certain things that you can hear in somebody's conversation and that should tip you off. It's a red flag. And this is just the red flag to like, stop, stop taking someone seriously. And I want Protestants to even realize this too, that they're, they're, they're making, they're being insanely arrogant. And that's the, and I touched on a little bit before we got started was, uh, or in the last segment was Catholics don't like this verse or Catholics don't know about this verse or something like that. And I just think that that is the height of arrogance to say that Catholics don't know about this verse because for most of church's history, I know this might come as a shocker to some of the listeners here, (laughs) but for most of church history, the television didn't exist. So 
what were people like, what was the church doing with the Bible? Well, there were people that dedicated their lives. There's commentary on it. You know, I've got, I've got, you know, the people who are watching, will see this. I've got the Catena Aria right here, which is a compilation from St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, he he graduated, he, he got all the commentaries of the early church fathers and compiled them into like one work. So that way you could see the commentary on every single verse in the gospels. So whenever you hear someone say, Catholics don't know about this, you know that they're immediately wrong. Every single verse is counted for in the Bible. And it's just one of those things of, it, it's almost like if somebody comes up to you and says, Hey man, I know how to get rich. You go to this website and you'll get a pop-up that says, click here to win a million dollars. If somebody says that to you in earnest, you know that like they make terrible decisions. They, you know, they, they, right. this person's very naive and you should probably not take them seriously. You know, listen to them out of a sense of charity, but like definitely don't let them give you advice for your life. So, right. yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't, like, um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah that's ahead. that's a great one. Uh, and I, I've encountered that a lot. You know, it's almost like, you know, the, the here's a verse that, you know, for 2000 years, you know, the entire church, over a billion people have just skipped over, never really, you know, it's yeah. 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 How in the world does that work? Like you pointed out, especially since. Uh, for a good part of history, uh, the transmission of the text was through monks copying it. Obviously, they copied the verse. Right. Well, and, and then, you know, there's a couple of responses to this, too, because it's just, no, there's not a single verse that the church is embarrassed about. Uh, because if the church was embarrassed about it, and if the church is so evil, then why is it still in the Bible? Yeah. Okay? The church had, and, you know, you'll have... This uh, the the church had a stranglehold hold on the Bible, and that's why it was all in Latin, so that <laughs> people couldn't understand it. Completely ignoring the fact that, like, for a huge chunk of her ch- church history, you know, Latin was the lingua franca. So, like, come on now. Um, but it's just like, okay, if that if the church was this powerful, why didn't the church remove it? And how did the like reformers magically come upon it? Um, because you know, I, I I don't understand how that works. And then the other thing is. A lot of uh, there, there are a few Protestant apologists who will bring in James two twenty four. You know, the only time faith alone is ever mentioned. Um, and but like he's like, oh, salvation is by faith alone. They will not bring up James two twenty four, where it says that <laughs> you are not saved by faith alone. Like, mm-hmm. so the only time, like, you do a bring up a PDF of the Bible, do a Control F, type in faith alone. It comes up exactly once, and it's whenever Scripture says this is not, you know, you are not saved by faith alone. So, but yeah, that's. Um, that's a that's a that's a really popular tactic that you'll see, and the just to foot stomp that like tell make sure your kids like if you're a parent make sure your kids are aware of that tactic, so that way because you also hear so many so many times uh, from people who have left the church down in the comments of these videos of like oh I used to be Catholic and then I started reading my Bible and and whatnot so make sure that your children understand that the Bible will never lead them outside the church. And if it does, if it seems to lead them outside the church, then they have the wrong interpretation and that they really need to go deeper. So, yeah, that, that's that's a that's one of the ones that like really frustrate me. And I think that's something that Catholics need to be aware of is the moment somebody starts trying to use the Bible to dismiss the church. Mm-hmm. You have to ask your, yourself some questions of, of like, OK, let's let's work this out very logically. How did this deception if this is a deception, how did it pass or how did how did this actually get through? And, yeah. you know, that it, it quickly falls apart the moment you start thinking about it. So tell your kids, tell your friends, you know, keep that one in mind. Yeah. And, and usually it's because the person's a former Catholic and as a former Catholic, they never read the Bible or right. read very little of it. So they never saw it. So they just assumed, well, all Catholics throughout all of history, you know, also never read it because if they did, they'd be Protestant, you know? Oh yeah, exactly. And you know, I, that, that accusation of Catholics don't read the Bible. I'm super appreciative of father Mike Schmitz and Ascension presents because I love the fact that like for two years in a row, the number one podcast was a Catholic priest reading the Bible. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's just like, oh, Catholics don't want people reading the Bible. It's like weird. My, my Spotify playlist says different. So, 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's that they're, we're taking the wind out of these sails of these arguments. And it's just like, maybe, maybe I'm naive to think this way, but I'm starting to see a real shift that like, Hey guys, like we may have had the, the church may have been in a rough shape, you know, in the seventies and eighties in terms of apologetics. But I mean, this is, man, we're in a boom right now. And like, we, I feel like we're gaining ground. Although, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to tell whenever you're like in the trenches. So yeah. Yeah. But. And, and unfortunately I think a lot of the low hanging fruit stuff isn't addressed. I, I think right. like, apologists uh, kind of ignore it. Like it's not important, but it really is. Well, yeah. And, and like, I, 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 it's funny. Last week I actually interviewed with Trent Horn to be his assistant. So, you know, fingers crossed for that. But, uh, cool. you know, one of the things that he, he mentioned was that he's wanting somebody to do like the, the grunt, uh, he didn't, these are my words, not his, do the grunt work for him. So that way he can do the things that no one else can. And, and I think that the, like the low hanging fruit stuff, I can do it. You, the listener, you can do it. I promise if you are listening to this show, you are qualified. Like, I'm sorry, but like, that's this, especially if you're listening to like a no name guy like me, like that means that you're embedded in this enough to do it on your own as well. And you don't have to wait for somebody like Trent Horn, Jimmy Aiken, Gary Machuda to go address these really dumb arguments because it's really not that hard. So like if we had an army of like apologists on YouTube, like pouncing on every video that like Mike Gendron puts, puts out, like that would be, oh man, that would be something that'd be quite the sight to behold. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Although you're not a nobody. Uh, I, mean, I found you, I, th- and I love your stuff. So <laughs> I, I don't know if that's an endorsement or, you know, that could be the kiss of death because <laughs> I'm not known for my, my taste, but nevertheless, uh, I love your stuff and, and, uh, we got to blow up your channel so people do find you, but well, yeah, I, I, I mean, we can't let this stuff pass, especially in the, today when information is so easy, you could just Google stuff and find out you yeah. know, whether it's true. It only takes a couple seconds. Well, and I think that's also something you, that you actually bring up something really important there. And I think it's really important to remember whenever we are talking about these ex-Catholics, and I see that the, the timer came up there. I'll try to wrap this up. Um, is that whenever back in the seventies, if you had a question, you know, you couldn't just Google it. You would have to go to the library. You'd ask, ask your parish priest, you know, whatever. And if your priest didn't know, you wouldn't be able to have the answer. So, you know, keep that in mind too, that, you know, whenever you're dealing with people who are, you know, boomers or whatever, they're, they're not going to have the best info. So. Absolutely. Listen to Hands On Apologetics. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. Hands On Apologetics. We are chatting with Kyle Whittington of the Kyle Whittington channel on YouTube. Talking about low-hanging fruit arguments and uh, they're so fun and entertaining. Uh, and uh, as you know, when it comes to history... History is just filled with all sorts of anti-Catholic myths and twists and uh, fabrications. And, and Kyle, one of your videos, you, you turned the uh, low-hanging fruit thing into a drinking game. And you predicted <clears throat> at the outset, before even watching the video, that he was going to mention one of three things. One of them is Constantine or mm-hmm. Constantine, the Emperor Constantine. And, uh, and you got it. Uh, <laughs> Gee, how did you know? Uh, that's tell us your secret. Well, uh, <clears throat> the secret is spending way too much time online, and you know, <laughs> I watch so many of these anti-Catholic videos because I'm always trying to find, you know, something that's got like a lot of views or something like that. I, I love it whenever they leave the comments sections up because then you can like see what people's reactions to it at all. But yeah, like bad history, you you'll always hear this. Oh, Okay, well, I won't get too I won't get too spicy here, but like it, it's honestly kind of like a brain dead response of like Constantine founded the church. It's just like okay, where did you get that notion? And recently, I I on the on the on the recommendation of Ben Handelman, I got a copy of the Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. Mm-hmm. And if y'all are engaging in these things, I highly recommend getting two books. So that way you can understand the source of a lot of these anti-Catholic arguments. And that's Lorraine Bettner's Roman Catholicism and Ellen G. White's uh, Great Controversy. I'd recommend buying them used so that way the publishers don't get any money. Um, but that's – I you read these because at the same time, it's always – 
it's hard to like be prepared for something whenever you've never heard that argument before. If you read these two books, you've basically heard it all in the low hanging fruit category. It's true. Yeah. And so that's where I think a lot of this whole Constantine nonsense comes from is from Ellen G. White. And I thought it was really hilarious because as you're reading like the first chapter, she goes in and she's talking about all these things. She's referencing all these church fathers and I'm, I'm reading it and I'm going like, oh wow, this is really well researched and I'm per- turning the pages and then it starts getting into the anti-Catholic nonsense and the references completely stop. And it's just like, <laughs> ah, I can see where you departed from non- or from, from history to just complete and total nonsense. And yeah, so you'll, you'll get these, you'll get this like, okay, Constantine did this and then one thing I've noticed that a lot of people will do is they'll use this anachronistic thinking that like separation of church and state is a Christian value. Um, and it's just like, well, hold on. What, what separation of Christian church and state, you know, it's like the Pope had power. Well, of course the Pope had power. King David also had power. So give me an example. And it's like, well, we don't see that in a new test in the new Testament. And it's like, well, the new Testament was written during the time when the church was really persecuted. So the church didn't have, secular power to exercise. But whenever that changed, well, what, what's the right course of action here? And people will go back and say, well, I have better ideas and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, well, cool. That's really easy for you to say in the 21st century, someone, especially as Americans, like you don't really have an opportunity to die for your faith, um, except in extremely rare circumstances. So what, you know, why, why can you do that? So you'll, you'll see twists of history, And, you know, you'll have, I believe people like John MacArthur, he will try to say like, well, us Baptists, we were the original Christians and we are the ones who, who kept the faith. The problem is with this argument is that very rarely will they actually, actually give you a name. It'll just be like this ephemeral group of Christians that kept the faith. And it's, you're sitting over there like, okay, well, what's the name of this group? So that way I can read up more on them and how they did this. Oh, no, no, no. You don't get any of that. It's just you just have to believe me. And it's just, OK, what what is this then? So that's why you got this. And then on the times that they do rec- give you a name of a group, it's like, oh, this was a group that the church uh, persecuted because they believed this. And then you go back and you look at that group. It's like, well, they also denied the divinity of Christ. So are you saying that this is the pure form of Christianity? So that argument doesn't hold up at all. So in order to take down the church, you have to have a lot of bad history. And, you know, it's the fallacy of, I don't know the specific name of it, but it's like just because something was written at the late 19th century, that doesn't make it true. And that's exactly what like Ellen G. White has kind of become. She's like this, a lot of anti-Catholic stuff is based on her writings and she has been thoroughly proven as a fraud through and through. And yet people still take her seriously. So I, I just, yeah, it, it's bad. History is a, is a big culprit. So uh, the recommendation there, read up on the history and do that. History, though, is kind of one of those like really things because you can't verify history except through like primary sources and stuff like that. And that's a rather lengthy process. Um, and if you if you have a conversation with that in the real world, it quickly devolves into a no, it's not. Yes, it is. And how can you really determine that? Um, but you would just like you, like you mentioned earlier in the show, like it was like, Oh, the church added books. And he's like the church added books and no one noticed. Like how, how does that work? So yeah. But I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, it always struck me as weird that, uh, here you have Constantine, which you would think is a, a, an high point in Christian history where, Roman emperor actually becomes Christian. He becomes the bad guy. And it's like, and that myth is like everywhere in Protestantism, not just the the low hanging fruit, but it's just like everybody just assumes, well, that's when the church became Catholic or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It's crazy. And and it tends to, you know, bad history tends to uh, like, there's certain sweet spots like, Constantine or the Inquisition or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so a lot of that, you have to remember that, you know, we're speaking English right now. We're in an English speaking country. Therefore, 
a lot of what we believe is based on what's called like the English black legend. A lot of it was anti-Catholic and anti-Spain specifically. This is why we have so much anti-Spanish rhetoric as well, such as the Spanish Inquisition and whatnot. The English had a very vested interest in making sure that sentiments toward the Spanish were extremely negative. Um, and if you're familiar with history and, you know, defeating the Spanish Armada and whatnot, like it doesn't take much to figure out why they would want that. Right. So this is why, you know, claims against the Spanish Inquisition are just remarkably bad. Um, it, it is just, you know, some claims that you say like, oh, the uh, the Catholic Church killed 50 million people during the Spanish Inquisition, which is just one of those. Cool. That was more than the population of Europe at the time. So <laughs> like, so the Catholic Church wiped out everybody in Europe and then began to spread and kill other people in other continents, too. Cool. I don't think that that happened. Um <laughs> So, it, yeah. And then you'll also get um, – and this is actually a more recent example. Uh, and I, a, book, a book recommendation I have on this is called uh, Bearing False Witness by the non-Catholic scholar, the late Rodney Stark. Yeah. Uh, but he talks about how you know, Pope Pius XII will be often referred to as Hitler's pope. Well, where did that sentiment come from? Because – Pope Pius XII is like this close to being declared righteous among the nations, which is like the highest honor that the that the Jews in, in Israel will give to a Gentile. And actually several cardinals that were under him have been declared that. And then I, I can't remember the name of the specific cardinal, but like out of his acceptance speech, he said the, you know, the, the honor goes all to Pope Pius XII because I was only ever acting on his orders. And so where do, where do we get this idea that Pope Pius XII was, was Hitler's pope? Well, it came from Soviet propaganda. Yeah. Once again, it's not hard to figure out why the Soviets would be so against the church. Something about this uh, uppity, you know, Archbishop of Krakow, you know, standing up, celebrating a mass with the Red Army bearing down on him and basically going, you won't do it. And then, you know, becoming pope, that was a massive problem for the Soviets. And well, we all know how that story ended. So we know that the Soviets were like right to be cautious about the church because it's just like the church constitutes the greatest threat to the Soviet Union and rightfully so. So, yeah, that's why that they would spread rumors is like, oh, the church is really Nazis when really and truthfully, nothing could be further from the truth. So a lot of times whenever you're reading anti-Catholic history, well, in any history in that general, there's usually a lot more going on to the story if it's not just an outright fabrication. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. It touches on the papacy again. Uh, so many distortions about, you know, what the papacy is, even the individual popes. Oh, yeah. Like you pointed out. Um, yeah. That's another sweet spot, too. Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, so, you, you know, you bring up the next point, the caricatures of the papacy. The, the guy that I was uh, responding to last night, he would he was just talking about papal infallibility is like, so everything the Pope says is dogma. And it's just like, no. And one of the, one of the points that I made on this was just, no, Catholics do not think that everything that the Pope says is correct. Go on Catholic Twitter and, and you know, search for Pope Francis. You can very clearly tell that most Catholics don't think that every word that falls from his mouth is divinely inspired. And so whenever they're condemning that, it's just like, cool, I would agree that that is also bad. It's a good thing that that's not what we believe. And, you know, what really shocked me about this guy's response, and I've never actually seen a, a, a Protestant like blaspheme this hard before, but he went so far as to claim that Jesus made a mistake in making Peter the leader of the apostles. Wow. And uh, he says like, it should have been Paul. It shouldn't have been Peter. And I was just like, that, oh, wow, that, that's yeah. insane. But you'll <laughs> notice that a lot of these low-hanging fruit guys, so Norland, he would probably be able to tell you, no, Peter wasn't the first pope. Here's what this verse actually meant. But a lot of them saying like, that, this is nonsense. That's not what the church means. That's not what the Bible means here. And then they will offer no other explanation of what it could possibly mean. Why did Peter receive the keys and the power of binding and loosing when the rest of the apostles just got the power of binding and loosing. Why is that there? And I like to point out, and Jimmy Aiken has this in his book, uh, you know, the Bible is a Catholic book, a breakdown of the cost of what it would, would have cost to like rate, to write St. Paul's uh, letter to the Romans. And I think it was like in today's dollars would take about $6,500. Wow. 
Wow. And that's insane. So whenever you do that, it's just people, nothing in the Bible is written idly. So if you say like, ah, Jesus made a mistake, just ignore this part. Well, that's a red flag and you don't have to pay attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. So Kyle, where do people go to check out your stuff on YouTube? Yeah, just go on there, uh, type in my name, Kyle Whittington. There's an H in the, after the W, so W-H-I-T-T-I-N-G-T-O-N. I'll be the probably first re- remark. Uh, otherwise, you'll probably see me suggested if you uh, hang around low-hanging fruit kind of Protestant videos. So, But uh, <laughs> yeah, come check me out there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. All righty. Thanks, Gary. All right. It's always a blast having you on the show. Uh, yes. And indeed, the hour's just flown. We, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk coming at you at the Terry and Jesse Show. Thank you so much for listening. And yeah, it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Man Center, turn off the Dojo lights. Thank you for listening. And God willing, I'll see you tomorrow here on Hands On Apologetics. Bye-bye.